All right. Last week we talked, uh, finished, talked, finished talking about the Third Ecumenical Council, uh, which was the council at uh, Ephesus. We talked about Pelagius and some of the false uh, doctrine, uh, doctrines that were uh, going around at the time. Uh, talked about how Pelagius introduced the concept of free will and that man can make the choice whether to sin or not, uh, which stood in stark contrast to the teaching of the Catholic Church that man was born in sin, and uh, as a result, that caused quite a stir. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so as we are finishing up on this concept of Pelagianism, where we left off last week, uh, we left off describing how that uh, it's been debated exactly how far Pelagius went in terms of his views on free will, and it has been reported by, you know, the, the individuals who were defen in defense of, of Catholicism at the time, uh, that he was saying that man can earn his way to salvation, which of course is not true. Uh, and a lot, there's many sources that suggest that Pelagius, that that's not what he was saying or teaching, but rather uh, that, they, uh, that man can in fact make the choice, make the determination in himself not to sin, so as to you know, make the case that we don't have to sin. And certainly I think that's that is true. That is scriptural uh, of what we find in the scriptures. Um, many of the, quote, church fathers before Augustine taught that humans had the power of free will and the choice over good and evil. Uh, Justin Martyr said that every created being is so constituted as to be capable of vice and virtue, for he can do nothing praiseworthy if he had not the power of turning either way. It's true. Uh, certainly God has given us that, that choice to be able to, to make our decision as to what we're going to do. Uh, and certainly being, being born and being a child, being innocent as not being able to understand the full complexity of the soul and of heaven and hell and those choices. Uh, we use a phrase, it's not a biblical phrase, but we call it the age of accountability, where one comes to realize that they are guilty of sin uh, when they compare what they have done to God's word. And that's kind of when that, that moment comes of, of dawning understanding as to what uh, they need to do. A Theophilus, not the Theophilus of uh, the, uh, the uh, recipient of the Gospel of Luke and Acts, uh, but in, in 180 AD he said that if, on the other hand, he would turn to the things of death, Disobeying God, he would himself be the cause of death to himself, for God made man free and with power of himself. Uh, so, obviously, Pelagius wasn't the only one that emphasized uh, the ability of a person to remain free from uh, giving in to temptation. The difference is, at least based on what I can tell, Justin Martyr, Theophilus, uh, even Irenaeus, all of these individuals, of course, there was a certain... Uh, there, there's, a, there's a kind of a difference between inherited sin from Adam and whether or not I can choose to sin after I come to the knowledge of the truth. And of course, to a certain extent, Augustine, and what he was saying later on here in the 400s, was making the case that man can't help but to sin. And there's nothing that we can do about it. We have been created this way. Not only did we inherit sin from Adam, but we inherited the frailty of the, of the flesh. And we, we can't not sin. We have to sin. And, and, of course, that's part of the case that is being made here, that Justin Martyr, Theophilus, and so forth, they're saying that, no, we can choose. Uh, however, that's not to say that they don't think that there is an inherited sin. Uh, so while Justin Martyr and, and Theophilus, so if they go to a certain point in agreement with what the Catholic Church eventually uh, culminated in up in the 400s, they didn't quite go so far as to uh, say that man has no choice. Irenaeus said, but man being endowed with reason, and in this respect similar to God, having been made free in his will and with power over himself, is himself his own cause, that sometimes he becomes wheat and sometimes chaff. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, and certainly, you know, you think about uh, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I discipline my body, I bring it into subjection. Uh, the sense of self-control, of self-will, to, to uh, conform our will to what God wants. I mean, that's a, that is a basic fundamental theme of the New Testament. And to, 
to ultimately end up, and again, remember we talked before that the, the Roman Catholic view of grace, their definition of grace is, is kind of skewed. And this is part of why they define man as, as there's not only nothing good in man from birth, in that he inherits sin, but also that there's nothing good in man at all, ever. He can't not help but from sin, or but to sin. And that's why, so it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's an elevation of grace beyond what the Bible teaches. It's a redefining of grace in that their thought process is that grace abounds regardless because man can't help but to sin. God made it where God's grace is such that it has to abound because man can't help it. And it's not just the fact that, well, man can do better. No, man can't do better. He has to sin. There is no choice here. He's going to. It's just part of what, how we're made. And that's a part of this thought process that was pervading, like what Augustine said in the 400s. Clement of Alexandria in 195 says, We have believed and are saved by voluntary choice. Keep in mind, a lot of these individuals, Clement of Alexandria is not the same as Clement I. Uh, a lot of these individuals, th this is still kind of on that uh, precursor stage of the Catholic Church before things get codified and before things kind of get put in uh, these canons to, to make the case about inheritance in and so forth. So it's, it's interesting that a lot of these church fathers uh, make certain statements that eventually the Roman Catholic Church will stand against. Jerome in 420 emerged as one of the chief critics of Pelagianism because according to him, sin was an unavoidable part of human nature. And this is, this is what they ultimately come to. And that's, we talked about Jerome a little bit as being uh, one of the one, well, he was best known for translating the Greek manuscripts, New Testament into Latin. It's called the Latin Vulgate. Uh, and and old, old school Roman Catholics still they, they still rely on the Latin version of the, of the New Testament. So, <coughs> excuse me, any thoughts through uh, kind of the, the, the contrast between how these, I, I, I'll use air quotes, Christian individuals like Irenaeus and, and Clement of Alexandria, Theophilus, Justin Martyr, these individuals, again, it, they, they, they are considering themselves Christians, but granted the gradual uh, falling away from holding fast to the truth. But even so, we can see how a basic fundamental principle of the New Testament about voluntary choice when it comes to sin gets degraded over the course of, of decades to the point that Jerome, who was a, a key component in the Roman Catholic Church in the 400s, makes a statement, man can't help it. It's an unavoidable part of human nature. And certainly, we, that, that's, that, that goes completely against Jesus and his example. I mean, that's one of the reasons we have the example of Jesus, not only because he had to be sinless to be the perfect sacrifice, but also, I mean, he was baptized of John, and what John said, hey, I should be baptized of you. But why did Je what reason did Jesus give to John as to why Jesus needed to be baptized, even though he had no need of repentance? To fulfill all... Well, pro prophecy, yeah, that would be part of it, too. What did, what did Jesus say? To fulfill all righteousness. Okay, to fulfill all righteousness, which prophecy would be a part of that also. Uh, but that concept of to fulfill all righteousness speaks directly to the example Jesus was setting. Even though it wasn't necessary for him because he had no need of repentance, he still did it anyway to fulfill all righteousness. And so this uh, example Jesus gives us certainly carries forward to help us understand we can choose not to sin. But granted, you know, as human beings, especially before we come to the knowledge of the truth, we don't really care. We don't really think about it. And then once we learn better, then it kind of maybe takes a little bit of time for us to train ourselves to say no, to avoid temptation, to look ahead, of, to make sure that we're prepared and so forth. And that's kind of that growth process that we go through. So anything through, through that? All right, the second article of faith of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is, which is what? Mormons, yeah, Mormon Church, states that we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. The Book of Mormon states that the original sin allowed humanity to progress in the plan of salvation. 
uh, that last part is it's not uh, there wouldn't be a need for a plan of salvation if man had never sinned but God knew man would thus the plan uh, but as far as the, the that first part we believe that men will be punished for their own sins not for Adam's yeah well that's true you know we suffer the consequence of what Adam and Eve did in the garden but uh, we will be judged based on our own decisions, our own actions, uh, and we will not be punished for the sins of others. That's, you know, that's the nature of free will. Any thoughts through that? Uh, Mormon philosopher Sterling M. Murren argued that the theology of Mormonism is completely Pelagian. Mormon theology teaches that the atonement of Jesus Christ has overcome the effects of original sin for all mankind. For example, the Book of Mormon, a sacred text for the Church of, the G of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, teaches the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he might redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good and evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law at that great and last day, according to the commandments which God has given." Do you detect anything strange about those statements, though? I mean, in theory, the, the, the idea here is that original sin doesn't exist. That, that, that's the, the case that they're making, is that we believe men will be punished for their own sins. But, but there's, there's a, a key component here that is added in that may not quite be according to the Scriptures. Does it stand out to anybody? Okay, isn't it interesting that it, the way it's worded here, Jesus Christ has overcome the effects of original sin for all mankind. What were the effects of the original sin? Two, two main ways in which it affected all of us when Adam and Eve sinned. Death. Yeah, death. Both the, the, the fact, again, there's that, that relationship of the physical death. Certainly, the case can be made that it's possible had Adam and Eve never sinned never received the knowledge of good and evil, they may have been allowed to eat of the tree of life and nothing would have ever happened and they would have just lived forever, maybe. Obviously, that's a hypothetical because in the end, we do die. But the reference that God made to Adam when he told him, if you eat of it in the day that you eat of it, surely you will die. And Satan said, no, you won't die. Well, of course, Satan knew very well what, what God was talking about, that it wasn't physical death so much as it was spiritual death. And of course... What Jesus has accomplished, has Jesus overcome the effects of spiritual death for all people? Be careful. Kind of a trick question a little bit. Has Jesus overcome the effects of original sin, which is spiritual death, for everyone? Okay. Does it say what? Yeah, okay. So it's not that it's been done and now everyone's saved, right? But it's available. Okay, and that's, a, that's kind of a distinction because notice, as uh, Doug mentioned, uh, the Messiah cometh at the fullness of time that he might redeem the children of men from the fall, which, yeah, the idea of spiritual death from each one, but it seems like this reference to the fall goes back to Adam. Give it the benefit of the doubt, though, and say it's symbolic, that the fall is symbolic of each man's own fall by sinning. But notice it goes on to say, because they are redeemed from the fall and have become free forever, knowing good and evil. From what are we made free in Christ Jesus? We talked about this Sunday. What are we made free from in Christ? In what way are we free? In what way do we have liberty? His blood. Okay, his blood, which does what? Redeems. Redeems us from our sin. Okay, it's not something that's automatic, and it's not something that happened 2,000 years ago. The blood is made available to us, but my sins were not washed away 2,000 years ago. And so it's interesting because they have, are redeemed. Notice the past tense idea of this. They are redeemed from the fall and have become... Who has? The children of men, he, it, the Book of Mormon says. No, no, that's not, ac that's not accurate. 
to act for themselves, not to be acted upon, save it be punishment of law, that great and last day. Yeah, okay. It also teaches there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. Pelagianism is not the official stance of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, even though they do, in essence, kind of believe in that Pelagian type of, of mentality. Um, is it true that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God? Let's be a little bit more accurate. Is it true that there is no flesh in heaven? True. Is, there, is it true that there will be no flesh in hell? Okay, so, so you'll still feel pain, right? But will it be a spiritual place or a physical place? Spiritual place, okay? So both heaven and hell is going to be spiritual. In fact, what, what does Peter describe in 1 Peter chapter 4 about the day of the Lord? What's going to happen to all of the elements in all of the universe? It's going to be burned up. Okay? It's going to be gone. There's not going to be anything left. So yes, from a perspective that God is spirit, and if I'm going to join in heaven, that yes, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, so there, that, that is true. But it's interesting that save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. It, unless I'm reading that wrong, it almost sounds like there are exceptions to that rule. Almost what it sounds like. And, and of course, keep in mind... Right, exactly. Well, yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of how I take it, is save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. In other words, there's no way we could dwell in the presence of God except for the fact that Jesus, his merits, his mercy, his grace. And that's, all, that's certainly true in that because of what Jesus did, and I have the opportunity to have my sins forgiven if I'm faithful and I obey God, then I will be changed. I won't be flesh. But keep in mind, Joseph Smith taught that the nature of God was that he was flesh and blood. That there was an aspect to God. Not that Jesus was flesh and blood on the earth. No, no. That God was flesh and blood, is flesh and blood. So there is a certain characteristic with it built into Mormonism that carries with it the idea of a physical nature to God. And for that matter, to heaven, the new Jerusalem. Okay, there's a very physical aspect to the beliefs uh, of the Mormon church. And I included that part in there specifically because of its relationship to kind of that Pelagian way of thinking, uh, at least in terms of the fact that, that a couple of these individuals who are Mormons themselves claim to be uh, very Pelagian in nature. All right, any thoughts through that? <coughs> All right, uh, move on to uh, Council of Chalcedon. This is a, um, the fourth ecumenical council. We've talked about the, the first three. Uh, this one is 20 years after the, uh, the last one, which was the one we just described, Council of Ephesus. Uh, so from 431 to 451. And keep in mind, there's been more and more, there's politics being played in the background of all of this. Remember in 431, that was really the first time you saw churches break off from the Roman Catholic Church and kind of establish their own way of doing things, their own pattern, mainly Eastern Assyrian churches and that sort of thing. So we come to 451, and it's interesting how that going all the way back to the 380s, how that more and more the emperor of the empire, empire of the, the emperor has been in, kind of incorporating himself into the functions of the church, the church, the Catholic church. The council was called by Emperor Marcion to set aside the 449 Second Council of Ephesus. Its principle, 449, that, that there was a second council, it's not considered an ecumenical council. It was kind of a get-together, and it's kind of a long story, but bottom line is it's not considered a major one. But there was some stuff talked about. They didn't like it. Uh, so this council was called by Emperor Marcion. He wants to do away with what they talked about two years prior. Its principal purpose was to assert the Orthodox Catholic doctrine against the heresy of Eutyches, Eute, who taught a variation of Orthodox teaching regarding Christ's human and divine nature. Now, I have, 
I have looked up everything I can find on this Eudicis guy, Eudicis guy, um, and his variation on his teaching regarding Christ's human and divine nature. Keep in mind, this has been an issue all the way since the first ecumenical council, okay, going back to the 300s. This is, this is, has been a, a long process and discussion, and really even today, are there still people who, who doubt or redefine the nature of Jesus when he was on the earth? It still happens today. It's not, it's not really anything new. But um, it's interesting because the slight variations that take hold in some of the minds of these people and some of these individuals who taught certain aspects, it's not so much their specific variation that's such a big deal. You get into it and it sounds very technical. And you're like, well, what difference does that make? The difference is what the representation or application of the thought process about Jesus' nature, what that then means for us. So the idea that, for instance, Jesus had a dual personality. His divine personality was separate from his human personality, so it was like two people inside of Jesus. And the case gets made that since we don't have that same uh, opportunity or ability to have that second personality within us to help guide us away from sin, we can't help but to sin. That, that's one example of an application of, of how these different varied uh, teachings regarding the nature of Jesus get, get utilized. Okay, From the surface, you think, what difference does it make? It does make a difference in application. So followers of the council believe its most important achievement was to issue the Chalcedonian definition, stating that Jesus is perfect both in deity and in humanness. This self-same one is also actually God and actually man. Remember, they have been trying over and over again to set forth in, in definable way the nature of Jesus when he was on the earth. And they've, they've gone, they've, they've said it one way, then they went back and kind of rephrased it, then they had to go back and fix that because people took that a certain way. And so this has been a recurring theme and so this is something that they're trying to address. Council's judgments and definitions regarding the divine marked a significant turning point in the, quote, Christological debates, which is, in essence, the debates that have been going on for about 300 years at this point over the nature of Jesus, his divinity versus his human nature. That's Christological or Christology. Uh, is kind of the, that's the main focus of it, is his nature of human and divine. Uh, so that's how they, or this is part of what they said. He's perfect both in deity and in humanness. We'll talk more about what that means here in a second. A great deal of political wrangling preceded the council assembly and was a major issue during proceedings with claims afterward that members of the assembly were being coerced to approve certain actions. When you start looking into the details of this, there was a, and I don't think, I don't, yeah, I do mention Leo's tomb. Uh, there was a tomb, that art tomb, tome, uh, which was just a, lay, a letter, uh, by Pope Leo. He wrote it to address the council because the Roman Catholic Church really didn't want to go along with some of the stuff that they were doing in Chalcedon, which kind of represented a major break from the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman emperor. Okay, this is, to a certain extent, this is kind of the first time you see the two in disagreement, where the Pope is like, uh-uh, no, I'm not going along with that. And based on what's, what, what the recording of the, the procession and everything, how it all happened, is it sounds like the emperor uh, tried to prevent this letter from the Pope from being read and then tried to prevent a servant from going back to the Pope to, to let him know what was happening. Actually, apparently the dude's life was in danger this messenger who was sent to the Pope, the, the, the emperor was trying to kill him or something to prevent Pope Leo from hearing about what was happening. So you want to talk about political, okay? It's just been getting worse and worse and worse. And this is part of the reason, part of, part of what sets the stage for going into the Crusades and, and I'm going forward through the 600s into the 1200s. This political aspect of the Roman Catholic Church doesn't stop. It just gets worse. Uh, and this is just, just kind of another, another brick in the wall, so to speak. 
Um, all right. The near immediate result of the council was a major schism. The bishops that were uneasy with the language of Pope Leo's tome repudi- repudiated the council, saying that the acceptance of two physes or, or, or the two... The nature of Jesus, the spiritual versus the physical, was tantamount to Nestorianism. Uh, Dioscorus of Alexandria advocated myophistism, myophistism, my, myophistism uh, and had dominated the Council of Ephesus. So a lot of these, these phrases, we talk about Nestorianism, we talked about that from several councils ago. But the concept of these different variations of the nature of Jesus has really morphed into the discussion of when was Jesus divine and when was he human? Okay, so a lot of it is no longer, well, how much was Jesus 60% human and 40% divine? Was he, was it vice versa? Well, the argument was made, no, he was 100% divine and 100% human. He was both. He was God in the flesh. Okay, well, now it's morphed to what the, 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 Phases is really the, the term here. The phases, at, when does he phase from his, his spiritual mind to his physical mind? For instance, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's begging the Father, let this cup pass from me, and he's sweating as great drops of blood. What, does that, what aspect of Jesus does that perhaps show the most between his spiritual and his physical side? Humanity. His humanity. Okay, this is a nervous point. This is an a anxious in, uh, time for Jesus. He's, he knows what's coming. We see the human side of him in that moment. Whereas, what's one example where we see Jesus's, I guess you could say, the, the spiritual side of or the divine, the divine side of him? What, what, what's one event which only three of the apostles were present for where you see very clearly the glory of the divinity of Jesus. Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, Mount of Transfiguration. And, and so you see these different events, and we read about them in, in the, you know, the, the records that we have, of the, especially of the three years that he's teaching and preaching, and you see both sides of this. Well, the argument then becomes, well, so how much of that applies to us? How much of Jesus' example applies to us? Because if Jesus had a leg up on everything, if he had some kind of advantage that we don't have, then that changes how we apply whether or not we can choose not to sin or, or what you know, the nature of Jesus when he was teaching certain things, how that might be applied. And so that's kind of what this is speaking to. Churches that rejected Chalcedon in favor of Ephesus broke off from the rest of the Eastern Church in a schism. The most significant among these being the Church of Alexandria, known today as the Coptic Orthodox Church. Some, sometimes you might hear references to the Coptic Church. Um, that's, that's related to this Coptic Orthodox Church. Uh, the rise of the so-called monophysitism in the East was led by the Copts of Egypt. Uh, and, and I'll define these terms here in a minute. A significant effect on the Orthodox Christians in Egypt was a series of persecutions by the Roman and later Byzantine or Byzantine Empire, forcing followers of the Eastern Orthodox Church to claim allegiance to Leo's tome, or what became known as Chalcedon, the Chalcedon definition. Uh, this led to the martyrdom, persecution, and death of thousands of Egyptian saints and bishops until the Arab conquest of Egypt. As a result, the Council of Chalcedon is referred to as Chalcedon the Ominous, or Omnius, sorry. Chalcedon the Omnius. I may have missed, but I think it's Chalcedon the Ominous. I'll have to double check that. Um, Among Coptic Egyptians, given how it led to Christians persecuting other Christians for the first time in history. That's, this is this is true, probably, in terms of organized resistance or organized persecution. That's not to say that some Christians hadn't persecuted others. What's one example that we've already looked at and covered, at least in terms of the organization of the Roman Catholic Church? What were they active in doing? Where was the church that belongs to Christ through all this? Where was the New Testament church? Where do you think they were? They had to go underground. underground. Yeah, they had to go underground. 
Okay? They, they had to kind of stay out of sight as much as they could because they had been labeled heretics by the Roman Catholic Church. And the way the Roman Catholic Church has now ingrained itself politically into you know, every aspect of government, well, to be a heretic wasn't just a, uh, a label. It carried with it significant physical repercussions. And so it's not like Christians did, that, that Christians weren't persecuted and by other Christians or self-proclaimed Christians until this point. No, it's been going on really since, you know, really the 100s at the very, at the very latest. I mean, you got to figure, even leading up to 100 AD, you got to figure there were these Gnostic, you know, Gnosticism, Gnostic Christians who were, you know, getting on to the other Christians and so forth. You had the apostles who were having to speak out against atrophies. So there was, there was some, uh, some issues taking place, but in terms of organized persecution, if you're not including the Roman Catholic Church towards the New Testament Church, then yeah, this would be the first time in history that Christians were fighting Christians. That's true. So I, I kind of thought that was interesting. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Coptic Orthodox Christians continue to distinguish themselves from followers of Chalcedon to this day. Remember we talked uh, about in the, with the last council about some of the stuff that was decided continues to be a source of bad blood and rivalry and, and outright sometimes hatred between these different organizations even now. Okay, all going back to the council in 431 and in this case the Chalcedon because of what happened leading to the persecution of the Christians in Egypt, Christians in Egypt, uh, this is, to this day, is still kind of a major, major problem for people. Uh, although the theological differences are seen as limited, if non-existent, it is politics, the subsequent persecutions, and the power struggles of a rising Roman Empire that may have led to the Great Schism, or at least contributed significantly to amplifying it through the centuries. The Great Schism, if you'll remember, we have on our timeline that we passed out many weeks ago, the Great Schism was listed in the 1000s, uh, and that kind of represents a, a major break uh, between with the Catholic Church and many of these other churches in the East and uh, so forth. So that, that's kind of what it's referencing, is that this is leading up to, in 500 years, what's known as the Great Schism. Thoughts or, or comments through all that? All right, many Anglicans and most Protestants consider it most Protestants, consider it to be the last authoritative ecumenical council. These churches, along with Martin Luther, hold that both conscience and scripture preempt doctrinal councils and generally agree that the conclusions of later councils were unsupported by or contradictory to scripture. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. It's interesting because and I haven't been able to find any more detail on exactly what about the first three councils that Protestants consider to be authoritative. I, I'm not sure what that means. I haven't been able to find any detail on this. But it's interesting, most Anglicans, that would be Church of England side of things, uh, and Protestants, which directly culminated from protesting against the Catholic Church, uh, they consider... Ultimately, this Chalcedon Council, that's it. We're not, you know, nothing else after this was authoritative. Well, in the very case it makes, well, certain individuals didn't consider any of the councils authoritative. So, it, I, of course, we don't. Only the scripture's authoritative, so it doesn't matter. Um, but like Martin Luther, I, I, I like this, this reference, the fact that they hold that conscience and scripture preempt doctrinal councils. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And in particular, Scripture preempts doctrinal councils. Anything through that? The Council of Chalcedon issued the Chalcedonian definition, which repudiated the notion of a single nature in Christ and declared that he has two natures in one person and hypostasis. Hypostasis. Or I've heard it pronounced hypostasis, but, but I think it's technically pronounced hypostasis, but I'm not sure about that. It also insisted on the completeness of his two natures, his Godhead and his manhood. So notice in particular the aspect of the single nature in Christ. 
Uh, remember that monophysticism, uh, monophysticism, that's the idea of the one nature, and that's the, the argument that Jesus was just human, even though he had the label of and was identified as the Son of God, he had the ability to do miracles, he wasn't actually divine in his nature. And that was, that's the idea of monophysticism. He only had one nature. He was only human, for instance, uh, and in particular, the aspect that he was only either human or he was only spirit. And of course, ne- this Neostorianism speaks to he was only spirit. He only appeared in the flesh. And that's part of what John was dealing with back in the 100, you know, in one, around the 90s AD. Uh, so, but, but both sides of that, whether he was only human or only spirit, that's considered monophysticism, whichever way they go on that. And of course, either way you go, there are major ramifications major changes to how we understand our nature if Jesus was only one or only the other. So this idea that he has two natures in one person, okay, this is this uh, hypostasis or hypostasis, this idea that both his human and his divine nature were encased in one person. It, It all exists as one. He was complete in those two natures. He was completely man but he was also complete in terms of, of the Godhead. In what way? Because remember, Paul references Jesus in him, the fullness of the Godhead or divine nature dwells. What does that mean? That in, in Christ, the fullness of the divine nature dwells. Is Jesus also the Father and the Spirit? Does it mean it's only, there's only really one deity who's God and he acts kind of as the Father and the Son and the Spirit all in one? And so if that's not the case, and the three, which make up Godhead, King James, New King James, and the newer version say divine nature, you have three. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If that's the case, then how was Jesus the fullness of the Godhead? In fact, Paul says he was fullness of the Godhead bodily. In what way, when Jesus, in what way was Jesus the fullness of it? Okay, he was eternal, that's, that's for sure. But he wasn't eternal in the flesh, obviously. What was, when, of course, Jesus, he constantly, while he was teaching and preaching, who did he constantly refer back to as the authority? The Father. Okay? But then what did Jesus say the Father had done with regard to authority towards the Son? Okay, He's given me authority, first of all, to judge, all right? He's given me authority, and especially in Matthew chapter 28, we know that Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The concept of the fullness of the Godhead represents his authority as being God, but also that purity, that holiness, that ca- the characteristics of God, that, uh, that glory of God existed in in the flesh, in Christ, certainly, but in his nature. He exemplified, he embodied the character of God in power, in his character, and in his uh, authority. All right? Uh, We'll stop there. We'll pick up. uh, There's not a whole lot more regarding this, but uh, we'll pick up here next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Thank you, everybody.